What is up guys, welcome back to the Wildcast. Hope y'all doing well out there. In this video, we're gonna be talking about an important development in the Virginia Roberts versus Prince Andrew case. As we talked about in our last video, there was a motion to dismiss that was presented in front of Judge Kaplan. And Judge Kaplan took the arguments under advisement last week. And this week he has finally made his decision and he has ruled against Prince Andrew in every single one of his arguments that he presented uh, in that last meeting where they wanted to dismiss uh, Virginia Roberts' lawsuit as facially insufficient and they also claim that 2009 agreement protected them from legal future legal liability. All of that was basically put aside by the judge and deemed to be legally insufficient to get them out of this lawsuit. So the lawsuit will proceed, but we're going to go into some of the details here. And so Judge Kaplan here wrote a 46 page, very detailed opinion um, regarding the arguments going back and forth between the two sides here. And he utterly destroyed uh, Prince Andrew's size argument. And he also did a lot of background on what's happened with Jeffrey Epstein and the the background of this case that is relevant to the uh, complaints that have been made. Jeffrey Epstein is relevant to all these things because Virginia Roberts ties back to him and Prince Andrew ties back to him. And that's why they were trying to use this non-prosecution agreement to get away. Um, but the judge completely embarrassed the arguments that were made by the Prince Andrew side. At one point, he even he all but called them stupid by saying that they can't even read a legal pleading, which is, which Virginia Roberts uh, pleadings in her complaint are clearly legally sufficient. But nevertheless, the defense said that they were they were facially insufficient, which is a very, um, very tall claim to make. And the judge did not buy it. As you guys can see here, he divided up all of the arguments and he basically said that all their arguments are uh, lacking any legal merit and he ruled against them on everything so I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize for you guys what happened here and the most important thing is of course um, the 2009 agreement which we've discussed in detail he went on to talk about all the possibilities and all the interpretations that could be relevant but in the end he ruled that the 2009 agreement cannot be uh, used because of ambiguity to protect Prince Andrew. There's no way to determine that he was one of the included parties to be defended in the future and be exempted from legal liability. So this is his last paragraph and it basically sums up what he said in the rest of the 20 something pages that we just went through. The 2009 agreement cannot be said to demonstrate clearly and unambiguously that the parties intended the instrument uh, directly, primarily, or substantially to benefit Prince Andrew. The existence of the requisite intent to benefit him or others comparable to him is an issue of fact that could not be properly decided on this motion, even if defendant fell within the release language, which, it, which itself is ambiguous. Again, there's no way for the judge to know what Jeffrey Epstein intended and who he intended to include in this. And there's no legal facts, sufficient facts in this motion, in this motion to dismiss that was presented by Prince Andrew's side to establish any kind of specific or legal argument to include Prince Andrew. OK, so it's ambiguous. There's no way for them to prove either way whether Prince Andrew was or was not included in this agreement. And the, the court can't make decisions based on completely un, um, unapproved obtainable facts. They have to go on what they know. So the judge has to proceed on established facts, not on hypotheticals that might or might not be true. That's what the judge just said there. Thus, independent of whether the release language applies to Prince Andrew, the agreement at a minimum is reasonably susceptible to more than one interpretation on the equally important question of whether this defendant may invoke it. As a matter of Florida law, this court cannot rewrite the 2009 agreement to give the defendant rights where the agreement does not clearly manifest an intent to create them. OK, a motion to dismiss is a serious thing. You're basically if the judge rules in Prince Andrew's direction, he's basically saying that Virginia Roberts has no legal grounds to stand on to file a claim to deny somebody uh, a lawsuit outright and to dismiss the lawsuit is a very big deal. So there has to be certainty with the and very good arguments made by the defense in order for the judge to acquiesce to their motion to dismiss. And there's not a clear argument to be made here that uh, that Jeffrey Epstein intended to protect 
Prince Andrew and other people like him uh, with that 2009 agreement. And he also went on to say that, which I didn't read to you guys, but he also went on to say in another section that uh, there's no reason to believe that Prince Andrew is protected by this because the only parties that were party directly party to that agreement were Jeffrey Epstein and Virginia Roberts. Okay. I said that like in every single video, I've talked about this 2009 agreement. Basically, when it comes to uh, black letter law, when it comes to civil cases like this and um, other legal agreements, you are not protected uh, from legal liability unless you are strictly named or or people can clearly ascertain that you were the person that the agreement was referring to. There's no clarity like that here, which is why I said from the beginning that this is this does not give Prince Andrew legal liability, does not protect him from legal liability because he is not referred to in that agreement. There's no reason in the world to think that that uh, Virginia Roberts and Jeffrey Epstein were thinking of Prince Andrew when they agreed to this back in 2009, when Prince nobody was talking about Prince Andrew. He was not a party to that law suit. Virginia Roberts was not suing him back then. Now she's suing him over 10 years later, and they're trying to use a 10 plus year old agreement to try and retroactively protect themselves from a legal a legal liability here in 2022, 2022. Um, and the judge was not buying that argument. OK. And in the next section, the judge addresses other claims that are made by the defense. Uh, they claim that Virginia Roberts cause of action were not legally sufficient under New York law. Um, and the judge goes on to dismantle those arguments. They also make the claim that um, that the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 12B6 requires that the judge dismiss this motion. And the judge went on to dismantle uh, all of those arguments uh, here. Plaintiff's complaint plainly alleges prima facie cases of battery and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Those are the two causes of action that Virginia Roberts cites in her legal complaint. Under New York law, indeed, defendant does not directly contest whether plaintiff's allegations satisfy the elements of those causes of action. The allegation that plaintiff was forced to sit on defendant's lap while he touched her is sufficient to state a battery claim under New York law, regardless of which parts of her body defendant ultimately is alleged to have touched. To state such a claim, a plaintiff need only allege that there was bodily contact, that the contact was offensive, and that the defendant intended to make the, the contact without the plaintiff's consent. Contact is offensive if it is wrongful under all circumstances, which certainly is a reasonable inference for Ms. Giffray's allegations. The only intent required is an intent to cause bodily contact that a reasonable person would find offensive. The sufficiency of plaintiff's emotional distress claim is similarly apparent. Uh, to state an emotional distress claim under New York law, a plaintiff must allege one extreme and outrageous conduct to intend to cause or reckless disregard of a substantial possibility of causing severe emotional distress, three, a causal connection between the conduct and the injury, and four, severe emotional distress. Defendant does not challenge the complaint's sufficiency as to any of these elements. Plaintiff has alleged severe emotional distress. She alleges that she was a, a direct and proximate result of Andrew's criminal acts. She asserts that he knew or disregarded the substantial likelihood that his action would cause plaintiff severe emotional distress. And although she so alleges in her complaint, it should go without saying that the alleged conduct, if it occurred, reasonably could be found to have gone beyond all possible bounds of decency and is intolerable in a civilized community. So the bottom line is the battery and emotional distress claims meet the legal standard under New York law, and therefore they are facially sufficient, they're legally sufficient, and the defendant cannot say that they're not. And this is uh, this was a silly argument by uh, Prince Andrew's side. So those two are the uh, most important arguments I want to cover, but the judge also covers other arguments that the defense made. Uh, they tried to argue that her uh, her complaint was illegal and uh, time barred under New York law. The uh, judge did not buy that argument. Next, they argued that the uh, complaints were duplicative. The judge didn't agree with that either. Uh, he goes on to explain uh, briefly those arguments here and why the defense is wrong. And lastly, the judge discusses the defense's attack on the New York Child Victims Act, which they claimed was unconstitutional. And the judge ruled the attack on the Constitution of the New York Child Victims Act is without merit. So the specific provision of the CVA they were attacking and claiming was, was unconstitutional was the section that gave extra time for 
underage victims of abuse to come forward and file complaints against their uh, their abusers later on. And that was a section they were attacking. And that's this is what the judge says uh, regarding that argument. The CVA's creation of a narrow window for allowing previously time barred uh, abuse claims to proceed is neither uh, more or less reasonable for having set the upper age limit for those who benefit from the window at 18 rather than setting it at a legal age of consent in New York of 17. Lacking persuasive legal authority with which to question the CVA's constitutionality, defendant's motion falls back onto doctrinal anarchism and inappropriate authority on claim revival at common law. Accordingly, as another court in our circuit has put it, quote, while his argument regarding unconstitutionality is creative, it is without merit. And there goes their constitutionality argument out the window. Um, the people who drafted the New York law were also good lawyers, and they knew how to make it so that it's not unconstitutional. So the idea that the New York CVA is unconstitutional is ridiculous. Um, and that's that. OK. And last but not least, the judge also ruled that the defendant's motion for a more definitive statement is also denied. And this was arising from the claim, according to Rule 12E, where Prince Andrew's lawyers claimed that Virginia Roberts' uh, civil complaint that she filed last year was not specific enough and that it was vague and unintelligible. And this is what the judge had to say regarding that. Ms. Giffray's complaint is neither unintelligible nor vague nor ambiguous. It alleges discrete incidents of abuse in particular circumstances at three identifiable locations. It identifies to whom it attributes that abuse. While he understandably seeks more details about the precise details of plaintiff's claims, he will be able to obtain that detail during pretrial discovery. Moreover, defendant's assertion that he cannot reasonably prepare for a response to plaintiff's allegations plainly contradicts contradicts the content of his moving papers, in which he denies Ms. Giffray's allegations in no uncertain terms. Conclusion, for the foregoing reasons, defendant's motion to dismiss the complaint or for a motion for a more definitive statement is denied in all respects. Given the court's limited task of ruling on this motion, nothing in this opinion or previously in this proceedings properly may be construed as indicating a view with respect to the truth of the charges or counter charges or as to intention of the parties in entering into the 2009 agreement. So the judge, that's basically boilerplate stuff. The judge is saying that it's not for me to say whether each side is telling the truth or not. That's for the trier of fact, with the, which is the jury. And but, but as far as the motion to dismiss goes, he has ruled that the arguments from the defense had no legal teeth. And that is why he ruled against them here. OK, so the motion to dismiss by Prince Andrew's side has been denied and the lawsuit will proceed. We will move on to discovery next and both sides will be able to present evidence against each other to try to prove or disprove their claims and to disprove the claims of the other side. OK, so that's what we're going to be moving on to next. But that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, make sure to like the video, subscribe, hit the bell and press all for future videos. And if you want to support my work, you can do so on Patreon. There'll be a link in the description box down below. You can support the show for just one dollar a month and you can talk to me directly and uh, watch videos without any ads, as well as many other perks that I offer to my patrons. With that being said, I'll see you guys all in my next video. As always, peace. You may consider yourselves officially updated.